Hey folks, welcome back to Welcome to My World. We are having some technical difficulties tonight, as you might be able to tell. I apologize for the dead air. Again, part of the technical difficulties that we're experiencing. Um, apologies if you were just listening in. I am going to go ahead and redo this uh, entire episode because I don't want to have it cut off and have folks think that I'm not going to be able to get to their question. Okay, so I've gotten some really great write-in and just um, in-person questions from folks who have been watching on YouTube, who have been listening on Spreaker or YouTube, to Welcome to My World or Dominique Does Life or any combination of the two. And here are some questions that I've gotten. Now, before I address that, I do want to say... I really appreciate you guys writing in with questions, and I do appreciate so much your respectful comments. I appreciate you being supportive, kind, and respectful, and I very much appreciate you chiming in and, and letting me know that you appreciate um, me sharing my story and me sh- about the rogue cop, for instance, and, and me um, sharing this sort of rough truth of spiritual bypassing. Now, these are the two episodes that I've gotten quite a few questions on, so I'm going to try to answer those for you. Some of these questions are verbatim, uh, and others are just sort of a conglomeration of different viewers who asked close to the same or the exact same question. So if I am answering a question that sounds similar to yours, it's very likely that I am, in fact, answering your question. Okay, so some of these questions are a little bit obscure and hard to answer, but I'll do my best. So the first question that I got from a listener on Spreaker and on YouTube was, am I spiritually bypassing? Well, first of all, the term is spiritual bypassing, although I guess spiritually bypassing is an appropriate choice as far as phraseology goes. Um, I would say that if you're asking the question, it might be on your mind. And if it's on your mind, and, and if this is something that's really stuck with you, that may be your subconscious's way of trying to say, hey, something's going on here. So I would say examine, you know, whether a couple of key things, if you are part of a group of some sort, whether it be spiritual, religious, what have you, uh, examine whether there may be gaslighting going on. Okay. And you really want to examine whether you think you may be inadvertently being used as a support personality to keep that gaslighting going, right? I would also like you to try to look at, you know, the people around you. Are they people who are fearful of, you know, some other person, some other out there coming to try to take away their prosperity? Are they people who are fearful of, um, of other kinds of people or people who are different than them? Are they people who are fearful of the world changing? You know, if so, it's very possible that you are in a group or in a religion or in a church or a synagogue or a temple or what have you that is engaged in spiritual bypassing. And if that's the case, it is really up to you to... A, A number one, step out of it, find a different group, and if the religion or spiritual belief itself just doesn't resonate with you, find what does, right? And and do what you can to, to resolve that with fact and logic and reason. Because there is such a thing as a shared reality, we don't create our own reality. I mean, there is a there is a um, subjective reality that we all experience. Each of us experiences differently, but uh, we don't create our own reality. I mean, we can we can build our lives and and steer our ship, but we don't create our own reality. So, um, you know, keep keeping that in mind. Try 
to make sure that any belief system that you're moving toward is authentic, that it resonates with you, and most importantly, that it is in line with fact, logic, and reason, right? And and that shared reality that's so important. We all don't just get to have our own facts and our own... um, you know, science, uh, we have to be able to agree upon a shared reality. Okay. So that would be my answer for you. I hope that helps. I, I, if you'd like to write in with a little bit more context, I'd be more than happy to hear your story and to answer you more thoroughly if possible. Now, the next question I think would do well with some more, um, added context as well. Uh, And again, if you would like to add some context, I'm happy to hear that and then address it on the air or in a video. So the next question is, am I racist? Now, here's how I'm going to take this question because I don't have the context necessary to answer it. And also, I'm just not comfortable in passing judgment on someone else. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that you may be concerned that you are or you may even be sort of rebelling against the possibility that you could be thinking, well, I'm not racist. It's not possible, right? So I'm going to say something to you. um, And I'd like you to try to listen up and work this into your reality and into your life experience. And this might not be pleasant, but here it is. It's, It's the truth. We are all racist. We are all bigoted. We are all prejudiced in some way. Our job, okay, as kind, conscientious, genuine, and respectful, at at the very least respectful human beings, is to move past that, to acknowledge it and face it head on, okay, and to help educate other people about how they can do the same. Now, that doesn't sound like an easy job, but as with anything, you're going to do this in small steps. You're going to do this by making small choices, sometimes big choices, but usually small choices, day in and day out about how you can better live your life and, and confront some of the issues that may be unpleasant, but that you need to face. Right? And that sort of undoes spiritual bypassing as it is. Um, I had a friend remind me recently that lies do not thrive in the light. Okay? So I will leave you with that. The next question is Do atheists spiritual bypass? Is that possible? Well, yeah, of course it is. Now, I do want to draw a distinction here atheism is not a religion. It can be dogmatic. It absolutely can be. And there can be issues, as with any system of belief, and yes, it is a system of belief, um, there can be issues with interpreting data and science and the facts in a way that lines up with your own confirmation bias and your own assumptions. So, yes, it's possible for atheists, even though they're not a religion or a spirituality of of any kind, it is possible for them to to engage in spiritual bypassing. I have the same question, uh, the next question, in fact, about Christians here. Can Christians uh, engage in spiritual bypassing? Yes, absolutely they can. Uh, In fact, Religion in and of itself is is rife with spiritual bypassing, and so are the various spiritual modalities. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who's religious is bad or everyone who's spiritual is bad, but I am saying that in order to be an authentic person, if you are going to have that as part of your life, you must confront that. You must confront that truth. You must confront the spiritual bypassing that's happening without, so around you, and within, within you. So yes, Christians can spiritual be engaged in a spiritual bypassing. They absolutely can and do. Um, yeah, one way to tell whether your community, your church, 
is engaging in such behavior is look around. Are the people around you pretty homogenous, ethnically, socioeconomically, um, sexually, uh, you know, whether or not they're gay, straight, bisexual, you know, queer, transgender, cisgendered, like, are they pretty homogenous? Are, are there not a lot of different folks in in that group, in that religion, or in that church? Right? Um, if there aren't, then yeah, it's very likely that there's spiritual bypassing going on. Also, are you noticing gaslighting? Are you noticing yourself or others being sort of co-opted, either um, knowingly or not knowingly, unknowingly, I should say, uh, into being support personalities, into being um, mouthpieces, into not thinking for yourselves? Is there gaslighting going on? Now, this is something that's hard to have to think about, but when you do think about it, it's very easy to tell if it's happening. So if that is happening, yes, your church, your group, your community is engaged in spiritual bypassing, I'm sorry to say. Okay, the next question is, what if my religion just believes in positivity and that negativity is bad? Well, first and foremost, I'm not familiar with any religion per se that believes that, though I am familiar with a couple of different spiritual modalities that believe that, and it is a very harmful belief. It's a harmful belief that's not genuine, that is not authentic, and it can really be very problematic, not just for those who believe in it, but for those who care about people who believe in it, and for those who are marginalized by the folks who believe in it. Perhaps your system of belief um, wants to marginalize and hide away people who are in pain, you know, whether from a medical or health issue, from a psychological standpoint. Um, maybe it wants to marginalize the pain of people who are starving, who are in poverty. If people's pain is being minimized in any way, well, that's wrong. That's wrong. And and is it bad? Well, it ain't good. It ain't good. It's it's definitely not appropriate. It's not right. Okay. So it, it's also like I mentioned, inauthentic because if we are um always positive, now, I'm not talking about looking on the bright side or anything like that, but if we're always positive and we ignore anger and are afraid of anger and pain and all of that, then we're building up a big mad. We're building up a big resentment within us. It doesn't matter whether we acknowledge it or not, it's happening. And that's inauthentic. And, you know, if your entire system of belief or way of life is based around avoiding something, um, you know, they, they might phrase it to you as, oh, you know, we're just striving for positivity. No, you're not. You're avoiding anger. You're avoiding upset. You're avoiding pain. You're avoiding hurt. And that's not possible in, in human life. It's not possible to be a part of the human experience and be genuine and authentic and yet avoid these things. Nobody lives life and doesn't feel pain, anger, upset, hurt, grief, depression, uh, sadness. It's just absolutely not possible. It's just not. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's very, that's very problematic. That's very problematic. Okay, so you can be content in life for the most part without striving for delusional positivity. You don't want to be part of a group delusion. You don't want to be gaslighted. So be real, be authentic. And, you know, the more authentic and the more real you are, the easier you'll find it to deal with your issues so that they don't become a big mad or a big resentment, right? So, you know, deal and move on. That's the best way to quote unquote, get rid of negativity, deal and move on. But don't tell yourself 
that the only reason you were able to move on was because you're clinging to delusional positivity. Not so. Not so. Um, so yes, that, you know, believing only in positivity and that negativity is bad is not a good thing. It's not helpful. It's not authentic. Um, the next question is in two parts. First, am I wrong for wanting to be happy? And then, am I wrong for wanting positivity? Well, are you wrong for wanting positivity? You're not right or wrong, but it's not healthy to just want positivity. Um, perhaps what you're looking for, rather than using the words positivity and happiness, or happy and positivity, rather, are you're looking to replace those words with the term contentment, right? So although we can't always have perfect positivity and happy clappiness, um, because that would actually be like a form of mental illness or personality disorder in and of itself, um, and definitely would be a form of bypassing and undermining and ignoring um, and avoiding, right? Because, because that's the case, and that wouldn't be healthy. I think the best thing that we can strive for, and a much more authentic thing than constant, you know, uh, psychotic happiness, if you will, um, is relative contentment. You know, just moments of contentment that outweigh the moments of discontent. Okay? That is what we talk about when we talk about the right to pursue happiness in life. We're talking about contentment. We're talking about being at peace and being content with our lives. And we're not talking about ignoring emotions and ignoring feelings, ignoring situations. We're talking about being able to be content in the fact that you're taking action to make the world a better place. Being able to be content with you know, your everyday life and to find those moments of, of contentedness, of balance, right? That's what we strive for. Even the human body itself strives all the time for homeostasis, for balance. So that's what we inevitably strive for and what we should strive for if we want to be authentic and genuine, okay? Now, the next question is, by only focusing on positivity, am I ignoring something important? Doesn't stuff that need to needs to be attracted, rather, to me, just come to me anyways? Well, yes, I think that the way that you worded this tells me that you know the answer to this, this question already. Yes, you are ignoring something important by only focusing on positivity. And no, there's nothing that you deserve to have attracted to you innately. We endeavor to deserve things in our lives by being charitable, kind, genuine, authentic people who strive to make the world around us the best it can be and to leave it better than we found it, right? So we don't just innately deserve, I guess, perfect happiness, you know, that's not a thing. It's just, it's not. Um, and no, things aren't going to just fly into your life because law of attraction. That's also not a thing. If you are looking at your life and saying and thinking that that's the case, that's your confirmation bias at play. You know, confirmation bias is an important, it was, for at least, an important survival mechanism. But it's something that humans are really moving past, um the need for in their daily lives, at least at this point, and to engage in a system of belief that plays upon confirmation bias is really to do yourself a disservice. Be authentic, be genuine, uh, experience whatever emotion or set of emotions or feeling or situation uh, in life that you're in. Experience it, feel it, and and don't, you know, be self-indulgent or self-punishing, but feel it, be at peace with it if you can be, let it be. Like the Beatles say in, in their famous song, let it be, right? Let it be, just be, okay? 
Um, so no, things aren't just going to be attracted to you or just come to you because you deserve them. Nobody does. Endeavor to deserve good things. You still won't, but you will definitely be a content person if you endeavor to and strive to work toward working up to deserving you know the moments of happiness or of contentedness if you want to go with our current metaphor um so work work up to being a little closer to deserving if you will those moments of contentedness by being the change you want to see in the world right action is important thought is great words are even better action is the best right and it's always good to find a balance between thought word and deed so no you don't just deserve things and no they're not just going to find their way to you because you're thinking in terms of positivity and law of attraction that's that's not a thing that happens again if you are Looking back at your life with hindsight being 2020 and thinking, oh man, I manifested this, I manifested that, and it's all with positive thinking. No, you're, you're ignoring um, probably 90% of the actual facts of the situations that you're looking back on. It's confirmation bias that is causing you to think that you have, I guess, manifested all of this stuff and attracted this stuff into your life by thinking certain things that's quite dogmatic it's quite uh, avoidy if you will it's it's based in avoidance it's based in dogma it's based in well if you want to go there with the whole positivity versus negative negativity thing it's based in negativity so if you're really striving to be constantly constantly um psychotically positive you're not doing too good of a job by believing in law of attraction, right? Kind of a self-defeating ideology there. Okay. Um, how can I tell, the next question is, how can I tell if spiritual bypassing is happening? Well, I think we addressed that previously. Um, but again, I will, I will try to hit, hit a couple of key points here for you. So, if you're noticing gaslighting going on, if you're noticing a lot of homogenous, you know, uh, ethnically, sexually, gender-wise, uh, you know, gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, you know, queer-wise, and you're kind of just seeing maybe only one of these various categories or only one ethnicity or what have you, one socioeconomic status, then yeah, it's very possible that there is spiritual bypassing at play because that's not representative of, you know, the world around you. And if your community isn't being represented in the group that you're currently in, uh, religiously or spiritually, there may be a reason for that, right? I hope that helps to answer that question. Now, the next question is very interesting too. Hi, this person says, my church group is really bad. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. And I love your honesty and your boldness. Hi, my church group is really bad. They spiritual bypass a lot. Can I change that? And if so, how? Well, I love that that's the first question out of your mouth. Can I change that? And, and then you follow it up with if so, how? That is so cool. Much love and respect to you for going there and for that being the first couple of things that you consider. Okay, so can you change that? You might be able to. On the whole, I would say, you know, people might be there because that's what they want. That's something that, that plays to their confirmation bias, plays to their needs or their wants or their egotism. But there might be some people out there who are questioning what's going on like you are, right? And all they might need is somebody else to speak up. And I think that's a great thing if you do so respectfully and with true loving kindness and authenticity and, and genuineness and practice, right? So one thing I would caution you on, though, 
is um, bullying. Not that you would do that, but you don't want to bully people. You don't want to kind of blame and make people feel like they're horrible individuals. Um, that's never helpful, uh, and it just serves to make you feel better about yourself at someone else's expense, which essentially is what spiritual bypassing is. So that's not a way to help it go away. That's a way to perpetuate it. So you've got to be careful how you address this. You've got to be careful, though, also with whom you address it. If you truly feel, and if you're one of my listeners, then you probably are able to identify folks like this by now, but if you feel that you may be dealing with a one individual or a group of cluster B personality disordered folks, it, it'd be best to just kind of back out and leave it alone. And then if people uh, choose to contact you and say, hey, you know, haven't seen you around, what's going on? At that point, you can make the choice if you feel comfortable individually talking to them about it and letting them know why you had to back away and back out and why you're not comfortable with this group, with this church group, okay? Um, otherwise, if you feel comfortable respectfully, kindly, authentically, genuinely sharing information on social media, uh, maybe sharing articles, sharing scientific data on the subject, you know, fostering a respectful discussion at the appropriate place and time, about this matter, I think that could help to change hearts and minds as well. But, you know, just use your own judgment, of course, as in anything, use your own judgment. Uh, the next question is, how can I adjust my own complicity in this, I guess this would be spiritual bypassing, without totally throwing away my religion? Well, you might not be able to. But I hope that that's not the case for your sake. And, you know, it, to me, the fact that you asked the question the way that you did makes me feel that maybe you already know the answer and that, may, that maybe in your mind you've come to realize that it may be time for you to step away from this particular religion, or at least this particular church, synagogue, or temple, or group that you're a part of, right? Um, and as far as how you can specifically adjust your own complicity, you know, within the group, or within any other groups, or any other um, churches, or temples, or synagogues, or what have you, I would say that you can adjust your own complicity by choosing actively not to gaslight other people, by choosing actively not to swallow any of the BS or the lines that are given to you. You can actively choose, right, uh, what kind of a person you want to be. You can choose whether you want to be a support personality or flying monkey for the you know, for the gaslighting or the disordered individual or group of people uh, that are perpetuating this gaslighting, or you can choose to be an individual and to say, you know what, this doesn't re resonate with me. I'm not going to be a part of this and to not perpetuate the cycle. I mean, it's just as simple and as complicated as that. And you know, so, so again, my overarching answer for you is that you might not be able to get away with this without discarding your religion. And again, something that, you know, may have worked for us 10 years ago, five years ago, um, you know, six months ago may not work for us now, may not work for us six months or a year or 10 years in the future, Right. So don't beat yourself up if that's the case. And, and just look at this as another opportunity to be genuine and to just find what resonates for you and what feels authentic to you as well as what is factual, right, and, and shared reality um, and what resonates with fact and logic, logic and science. Okay, so good luck to you. I, I really hope that you're able to find a satisfactory and swift 
uh, conclusion that allows you to be content and authentic. Now, the next question is uh, regarding standing up for your rights with a police officer, which is something I covered, or with law enforcement of any of any kind, which is something I covered in the sort of rogue cop episode I did. Where I detailed my kind of horrific experience being run off the road by a police officer, by a rogue police officer. Um, so how do you stand up for your rights without pissing off the cops? Okay, I like that. That's there are some good questions here. Um, but you know what? I, here's what I want to I want to get to another question. I think before I address. Um, some of these. Okay. So bear with me here. So, okay. <laughs> I really like this statement slash question. Very straightforward. Wait, if I'm pulled over, shouldn't I just explain things to the cop? Like answer their questions? Well, no, you shouldn't. Short answer, no. Uh, because they're not here I, I hate to say this, but they're not here to work for you. They're here to collect tax revenue. They're here to kind of up their reputations. I mean, there are great cops out there, don't get me wrong, but the system is quite corrupt. And there is there are some real systemic issues at play. So anything you say will, not can, will be used against you. And... You know, many people talk themselves, thinking they're going to talk themselves out of trouble by simply explaining, hey, you know, no, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, texting and driving or DUI or what have you. Uh, you know, no, I wasn't swerving. No, I wasn't, uh, I don't know, doing some illegal thing or driving away from a bank robbery. I was just trying to get home because I needed to use the bathroom or whatever, rather than, you know, people think that they're going to talk themselves out of trouble, but rather than talking themselves out of trouble, nine times out of 10, they end up talking themselves into more trouble. So again, just, it's really important to realize that unfortunately, most police out there, you know, this is a systemic issue, are not working for you. They are here to collect tax revenue. They're here to up their reputation, get, you know, uh, this is their way of, of moving up the totem pole, moving up the ch chain of command. Um, and unfortunately, there is such thing as a quota uh, nowadays, in the United States at least, where police officers have to get, for instance, uh, in this area, I believe it's uh, one DUI and one seatbelt violation per shift per traffic officer. So, you know, let's say they're about to go off shift. They haven't found a seatbelt violation or DUI or whatever they're looking for. Uh, they see you. It's late at night. It's early in the morning. What have you. You're the only car on the road. They're about to go off shift. They don't care what you're actually doing. They just want to get off shift and get a win under their belt so they can promote themselves and so that they can move on with their lives. They're not even concerned about your well-being or your rights. That's why it's your job, look, because it's nobody else's job to take care of you, right? In life, it's your job to take care of you. That's why it's your job to stand up for your own rights. And you're not going to say, hey, asshole, or something like that. You're going to be respectful, as respectful as possible while being authoritative and, <clears throat> excuse me, while making it clear while saying as little as possible that you are going to stand up for your rights and that you're a formidable person. So essentially, it's like a bully or a gang member, you know, coming up to you. Make sure that you're not a good target. Make sure that you're a really tough target and that they'll just say, you know what, forget it. I'll just wait for the next person, right? So part of that is not launching into an explanation or a story. 
And that's very important because your words are likely to be twisted. They're likely to say, oh, you know, now that they've got you talking, oh, you're slurring your words or, oh, you lied about something or, oh, I just caught you in a criminal act or what have you. So don't make it harder on yourself. I think the best things you can say and do, if you're, for instance, if you're pulled over by a police officer, uh, the best things you can do are uh, have all of your information out there and ready so that you don't have to reach for anything and have the unfortunate potential of possibly being shot or assaulted or killed or raped folks, this does happen, and it happens much more regularly than you might think. Um, So don't be reaching for anything, um, especially folks who, I'm going to be real, especially white folks, okay? If you haven't grown up having to know that procedure of, you know, hands on the wheel, no reaching, know it now because it applies to you too it it applies to all of us now not that it was good when it just applied to folks of color absolutely not but it applies to all of us now so keep get all of your information out before the officer approaches your car you know you might even want to have it together in like a little you know plastic bag or something when you're driving just so that you don't have to reach and so that you don't have to open your window super wide and so that you don't give them an opportunity to uh, have a reasonable articulable suspicion of a crime i.e. making up BS about smelling alcohol, smelling crit cocaine, smelling you know god knows what some ridiculous thing, weed, whatever in your car. So have your stuff together, have it ready when they approach the window, don't roll the window down then more than about uh, an inch and a half, okay? If they try to bully you into rolling your window down further, say, you know what, uh, for, for my safety, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Thank you. I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Um, if you need to say anything at all. Now, you... Uh, don't reach into anything. Don't don't scratch yourself. Don't reach into any pockets. Simply have your hands on the steering wheel with all of that information in your hand. It, and you should have a camera going at this point. Live streaming is the best so that they just can't reach in and delete the video from your device. Uh, so have that in, that information in your hand. Hand it through the slit in your window without touching the cop. And allow them to look over your paperwork, look over your information. Uh, They'll bring it back to you. They may say, what are you doing out so late? What are you doing out so early? Where are you going? Um, Did you have your phone in your hand? Did you, were you, you know, were you doing this? Were you doing that? Do you, were you smoking something? Were you on something? And you don't want to say, no, I wasn't, or yes, I was, which would be a really dumb thing to say, by the way. But you don't want to go there. What you want to say is, gosh, officer, do you have a suspicion that I was? Why is that? You do? Gosh, why is that? And and just respectfully kind of play, play dumb, respectfully, and again, authoritatively, without being aggressive or passive or passive-aggressive. Um, so it's a it's a unique balance that you might want want to look into striking there. So authoritatively stand up for yourself. Authoritatively stand up for yourself. You might say something along the lines of, you know, if they really start badgering you about it, say, "Gosh." Um, I'd love to, while your hands are still on the wheel, no reaching or anything like that, gosh, I'd love to know what your reasonable, articulable suspicion is that I've committed a crime. What, do you suspect that I was? You know, let's say they say, oh, I smell alcohol or marijuana or, I don't know if crack even smells like anything, but crack or whatever. Um, You might say, 
again, you might say something like, gosh, um, is there a reason that you would suspect that I was doing that? Uh, yeah. And if they continue on with it, say, well, I'd love to know what your reasonable, articulable suspicion is that I've committed a crime. Now, that's really serious. I, I wonder what your uh, reasonable, articulable suspicion is. You've got to have a good reason, I'm sure, for pulling me over wouldn't do that without a good reason is essentially the idea behind it so let me know what your reasonable articulable suspicion is that I've committed a crime so when you phrase it that way they're going to know that you were educated on what your rights are and that you're willing to stand up for them so if, again if they continue to badger you never say just no or yes or whatever just say gosh, is there a reason that you think I, I am doing whatever ridiculous thing they just asked if you were doing? Is there a reason you think I might be? Is, is there a reason that you think that I might be doing that? Why do you think that? And if they keep going, uh, well, I'd love to know what your reasonable, articulable suspicion is that I've committed a crime. If they keep harassing you, um, and even if they don't, as long as they don't just let you go. If, if they're about to let you go, you don't want to do this. But if they keep at you, you're going to say, you know, gosh, I'd, let, I'd love to know your badge number and your name. Okay. And if you could grab your supervisor, your shift supervisor, and get him or her out here, that'd be great. Uh, that right there, again, is going to show them that you are capable of standing up for your rights, that you know what your rights are, and that you know what procedure is. And that may be intimidating to some cops, and also it's just going to be good for you that you're following procedure. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of questions here related to, like, what do I do? How do I stand up for my rights without pissing off the cops? That's one question. Well, uh, what exactly should I say or do if I'm ever stopped by the police? Uh, you know, why should I just explain things to them and hope that I can get on my way? Again, no. I gave you some good um, answers and some good information about what you should do. So let's review that really quickly. I know I kind of went through it really fast, just boom, 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 point by point. But okay, so as you're being pulled over, you see those red and blue lights flashing behind you. First of all, don't freak out. Remain calm. You are in control of the situation. Remain calm. You want to remain calm throughout the encounter. You want to have all of your information, your um, license and registration and insurance all together. So either you put it in a little, you know, plastic baggie or something before you start driving. Um, if you're concerned or if you're a professional driver or what have you, uh, so that it's readily available. Or you just quickly get it out before the police officer or officers approach your car and you have your hands okay you start your video camera that's what you do next and live stream if you can let them know that it's recording by the way when they come up to your car um have your hands on the wheel at that point with all of the information in one of your hands that you just got together right? All of that license, registration, insurance, all of that. And you're going to only open your, your window about an inch and a half. Okay. No more than that. Doesn't matter what they say. No more than that. You're going to be kind, polite, and respectful throughout the entire encounter. You're going to hand them that information through the window. You're going, if they you know, ask you questions, or if they just aren't looking like they're going to let you go, you're going to simply counter by saying, you know, what, what's your suspicion that a crime is being committed? Why did you choose to pull me over? So the actual legal wording is, what is your reasonable, articulable suspicion that I've committed a crime? Okay. So they have to have reasonable, articulable suspicion. That is why you're only going to keep your window lowered about an inch and a half, right? No more than that. And only one window. If you get pulled over, you close your windows, you close your, your um, sunroof, your moonroof. Make sure everything is closed except for that one driver's side or other window wherever they approach you. Only one window at a time can be open and only like an inch, an inch and a half. Okay. 
it's really important because part of their process is that they're going to want to say that they, you know, likely they're going to want to say that they smell something or that they, um, you know, hear, hear you slurring your speech or I don't know, something. So they, they're going to be fishing for a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed so that they can further search you and invade your privacy and disrespect your rights. So you're going to want to make sure that you have that window rolled down only the slightest bit. When they say, you know, could you roll your window down more? Or, ma'am, I need you to, or sir, I need you to roll your window down. You're going to say, I'm good, you know, I'm fine. This works. I can hear you. Thank you, sir or ma'am. I can hear you, officer. Thank you. And, uh, you know, politely decline. Just no thank you or thank you. I can hear you just fine. And if they continue to molest you about that, you can say something like, you know, I feel I'd feel safer if I just had kept my window as it is. Thank you. You know, and and uh, if they are badgering you, harassing you or simply not letting you go, whether you've done anything or not, and I hope that you're not DUI or anything like that. That's not smart. That's not safe. But, you know, whether you've done anything or not. Don't admit to anything. Don't take any tests. Don't step out of the vehicle unless they tell you that you've been detained, in which case you have to step out of the vehicle if they, you know, if they tell you to. But you need to, if they won't leave you alone, um, not only do not answer questions and and simply answer a question with a question, why, you know, why do you think that I have been? Why do you have a reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed? You know, so when they ask you if you were speeding or if you know why you were pulled over or, you know, were you smoking something? Were you drinking something? Were you wearing your seatbelt? It's just why do you suspect I wasn't wearing my seatbelt? Why do you suspect a, a crime has been committed? Do you have a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed? You know, right there. Let them know that you're on point. Um if the again if that interaction continues you're going to you're going to let them know first and foremost that they're on video you're not going to make any sudden moves you're not going to reach into your purse into the back you know seat of your car under your seat into the glove box into your pocket or basically anywhere you're going to keep your hands in sight preferably on the wheel uh particularly if if this cop is a little strung out or a little you know stressed or what have you you're going to want to keep your hands on that wheel and not move them okay and you're going to want to inform them that they're on video. Oftentimes, but not always, you're going to notice their demeanor change quite quickly when you inform them that they're on video. And you're going to um, then ask them if they continue to harass you and, and molest you and bother you. You're going to uh, respectfully say, officer, am I being detained? And they may lie to you. Actually, lying to you is legal. They can do that legally. So don't take anything they say as, as you know, written in stone. Know your rights so that you can know when they are lying to you so that you don't comply with some false, you know, request or false direction or false information, right? Um, So if you're not being detained, they can't tell you to get out of the car. They can't search you. If they try to search you, say, you know, officer, I just don't consent to any searches or seizures. If they continue to try to ask you questions, you can say, officer, I I am not going to answer any questions at this time. And then simply, you know, why do you think I do you think I have been? Do you have a reasonable, articulable suspicion that I have been doing A, B, C, X, Y, Z, whatever? Do you have a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed? Um, and if they continue to badger you, you might say something like, "Okay, am I being detained?" Because you want to clear that up. Um, am I being detained right now? And if they say yes, but aren't arresting you and aren't following procedure, then you can say something like, oh, well, what am I being detained for? What's your reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed? 
You know, they can't detain you without that. So if they can't articulate a reasonable suspicion for pulling you over, for stopping you, then you're not detained. And you need to, don't be disrespectful, don't be rude, but press them on that if they continue to bother you. Okay, so if I'm not being detained because there is no reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed, it sounds like I'm free to go. Am I free to go or am I being detained? Make sure that you really get them on this point if they keep after you. And at some point, they're going to have to fess up and let you know you're not being detained. They're, they're going to have to. If you keep pushing them on it, they're going to have to let you know that. And if they don't, it's on video, it's live streamed, and you have just asked for their uh, shift supervisor and their name and badge number. So they're going to be in big trouble. Um, you're going to fo follow up with a complaint about that later on. Now, if they tell you, yes, you're being detained, and then they articulate a reasonable suspicion that you've committed a crime, and they do ask you to get out of your vehicle or something, unfortunately, you do have to do that. But at that point, you can let them know that you do not consent to any search or seizure. If they ask you something like, can you turn out your pockets for me? Can can I search your car? Say, I'm not okay with that. I am not giving you permission for any search or seizure of any kind. I don't give you any permission for search or seizure. And guess what? If they're searching your vehicle, you can tell them to stop and they legally have to stop. Okay? So if they've asked you, hey, can we search this vehicle and you've consented, right? and they're searching around and what have you, and you're not comfortable with it, you can say, stop, I revoke my consent at this time. Now, if they keep bothering you, badgering you, harassing you, you're going to request a lawyer, and you're going to, again, want to be sure that you're being detained, because sometimes they'll try to pull this stuff without actually detaining you. And again, legally... They can't detain you without a reasonable, articulable suspicion that a crime has been committed. Okay, so I hope that this helps. So there's no explaining. There's no, oh, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't smoking, whatever. I wasn't speeding. I wasn't, uh, I didn't forget to use my turn signal. I didn't, uh, you know, not put on my seatbelt or, oh, my wife is pregnant and, and in the hospital or nothing. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. Nothing is going to get you out of trouble. They don't actually care what's going on in your life at all. So what they care about is themselves advancing their own causes and most of the time at least and uh, self-aggrandizement and, and feeding their own ego. So no explaining things away while once in a while, again, you might get a decent officer. I, I wouldn't count on it. I wouldn't count on that being the case every time if something like this happens to you uh, more than once. So please don't assume goodness or respect for the law on their part. That That would be a mistake. That would be a mistake. Um, stand up for your rights. Stand up for your rights. And again, be respectful throughout the entire encounter. I know it's hard, but be respectful uh, throughout the encounter. Know what your rights are. You do not ever want to um, consent to any kind of test. Even if you, for instance, they say something like, oh, you know, you haven't been drinking and driving? Well, let's just clear it up with a, you know, a, a, I don't, I can't remember what they call those tests, but like the hand-eye coordination test or like the roadside sobriety test or whatever, or, oh, let's clear it up with a breathalyzer test. Um don't consent to that. First of all, the the roadside sobriety tests are proven not to actually have any correlation or any relation whatsoever to whether or not somebody is sober or drunk or impaired in any way. 
So it, it's not going to tell them anything. All it's going to do is give them more evidence in their BS story about how you're some, you know, offending criminal or what have you, because they benefit directly from it. Uh, they benefit from these arrests. They benefit from these charges and, you know, revenue is collected, right? So they're, they have no reason to give you the benefit of the doubt. They have no reason to be honest. Nothing is keeping them honest. Only, only you standing up for your rights is likely to keep them honest, right? Or at least as honest as they have to be in the moment. So no uh, committing to any of these tests. You know, yeah, you, we know you probably haven't been drinking or smoking anything or what have you, but don't consent to any of these uh, these tests. All it's going to do is turn out to be evidence that's used against you. Um, and even breathalyzer tests are not, you know, you, you're not going to just get away with, without being charged, or I'm sorry, without being um, found guilty of, of driving under the influence just because you pre- uh, passed a breathalyzer test. I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's true. This has happened in many cases, and... Uh, you don't want to subject yourself to anything that could possibly be used to incriminate you. And it doesn't matter if you had one beer and you're not over the limit, they will still consider that DUI. It doesn't matter. I mean, it really, it doesn't look good uh, on your part if you have had half a glass of wine and not six glasses of wine, right? Right doesn't really look good. It doesn't make you look any better. And even if you've had nothing, so what? There's still this story and all of this manufactured evidence against you. And now you've submitted to this unnecessary, you know, test on top of everything. So don't do it. I know that, you know, human nature is that you just, you want to explain yourself. You want to let them know you haven't been drinking or what, what have you, or, or smoking anything, but that's not what this stuff was about anyway. It's about revenue collection. Oftentimes it's about egotism. Oftentimes it's about, um, you know, working their way up the food chain. Oftentimes it's about uh, having a personality disorder, right? Because uh, the quote-unquote hero professions um, are rife with narcissists, with sociopaths, with cluster bees. So you're not going to be able to explain your way out of trouble with someone like that, right? So no searches, no seizures, no consenting to anything like that. Stand up for your rights. If you are pulled over and and questions are asked after you, again, set up that camera, have everything out, don't reach for anything, have your hands on the steering wheel, have that only one window rolled down, only about an inch and a half after you've done all of that, after your video is live streaming. Remember, the only thing you say when they ask you, have you been drinking? Did you know you were speeding or whatever? Is, gosh, um, do you suspect that I was? Well, what's your reasonable articulable suspicion? Great. Am I being detained? Okay, I'm not being detained. Great. Uh, Thanks. Have a nice day. Or, oh, if they, you know, BS you around or say, yes, you're being detained when you're not, or it's an illegal detention or what have you, you're going to say, yeah, okay, so just for the record, just for everyone's protection, I want to ask you for the camera what your uh, name and badge number are, and I'd love to grab your shift supervisor, please. I'd like to have that uh, person come out, please. So they're obligated to do that now. Now, not only are they on camera, their shift supervisor's coming in, which may or may not be a boon to you, but it is going to be on record that you requested the shift supervisor. And, you know, it's, it's like having your supervisor called in, um, by a client or something, you know, that you're in trouble, or at least you have to mind your P's and Q's. And you happen to know that you are following procedure and that you are standing up for your rights. So if they do tell you that you're not being detained or, you know, if they try to tell you that you are being detained when you're not, because they haven't given you a reasonable, articulable suspicion 
that a crime has been committed, you're going to want to be very direct with them. Say, well, okay, since I'm not being detained, am I then free to go? And they may lie to you. They may mess you around a bit. But eventually they are going to have to tell you that, yes, you're free to go, right? So this is how you stand up for your rights. I think I covered all of these questions uh, just now. Uh, should I answer the cops' questions? How do I stand up for my rights without pissing off the cops? And what exactly should I say or do if I'm ever stopped by the police? So I hope that that's a good answer. I hope I didn't rush through everything too much for you. And I just am glad that these questions were asked because I really want to help you all stand up for your rights. Now, hopefully you are being a law-abiding citizen and you're not taking advantage of... uh, you know, knowing your rights just to do things that are illegal, but, you know, that's not something I would advocate for, but, you know, you've got to stand up for your rights. It's it's not, innocence is not a defense anymore, if it ever was. Uh, Innocence is not a defense. Not having done something does not mean that you're not going to be charged with or punished for something. I mean, my goodness, there are people who have been Uh, thrown in jail, who have been executed, who didn't commit the crimes that they were accused of. So don't be that person. Don't allow yourself to be the next statistic. I hope that that helps. You guys, thank you so much for asking these questions. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for having this discussion with me. Be well and have an awesome, wonderful evening. Chuggle again